On October the 7th, 1994, Sarah McClendon, the senior White House news correspondent who has covered 11 presidential administrations, beginning with that of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, demonstrated once again that she has the courage to ask the hardball questions other journalists only dare to think. As she confronted William Jefferson Clinton about the Central Intelligence Agency's involvement in nefarious activities, activities set at a remote airport in western Arkansas while Clinton was Arkansas's commander-in-chief, she finally cornered the man who was a co-conspirator in bypassing the Constitution of the United States of America. In doing so, the president was not only forced to address the looming scandal that may impeach him, Clinton once again demonstrated his trademark talent. He lied. Sir, uh, the Republicans are trying to blame you for the existence of a small air base at Mena, Arkansas. This base was set up by George Bush and Oliver North and uh, the CIA to help the Iran Contras, and they brought in plane load after plane load of cocaine there for sale in the United States. And then they took the money and bought weapons and took them back to the Contras, all of which was illegal, as you know, under the Bolin Act. But tell me, did they tell you that this had to be in existence because of national security? Well, let me answer the question. No, they didn't tell me anything about it. They didn't say anything to me about it. The airport in question and all the events in question were the subject of state and federal inquiries. It was pr primarily a, a matter for federal jurisdiction. The state really had next to nothing to do with it. The local prosecutor did conduct an investigation based on what was within the jurisdiction of state law. The rest of it was under jurisdiction of the United States attorneys who were appointed successively by previous administrations. We had nothing, zero, to do with it, and everybody who's ever looked into it knows that. Polk County Prosecutor Charles Blake the man who initially attempted to investigate the MENA Arkansas criminal activities would surely take exception to Mr. Clinton's assertion that, quote, the local prosecutor did conduct an investigation based on what was within the jurisdiction of the state law, end quote. In fact, it was Blake who went directly to then Governor Clinton to seek funding for his investigation, seeing as how rural Polk County lacked the financial resources to deal with the CIA. When it became apparent that uh, nothing was going to be done on the federal level, that's when I began more actively pursuing it. Prosecutor Black, a Clinton supporter, met with the governor and handed him a letter requesting money for a state grand jury on MENA. His response to me was that he would uh, uh, get a man, something to the effect that he would get a man on it and would get word back to me. And uh, I never heard back. Years later, Clinton said he offered $25,000 to Prosecutor Black's boss to fund a grand jury. But Charles Black and his boss claim they never heard about any offer of money from Governor Clinton. I believe Bill Clinton's an honest, respectable man, and I have to believe that he did that. But the fact is, I never got that word myself. Black wasn't the only man affected by uncooperative superiors who for some strange reason seemed willing to turn a blind eye to blatant disregard for America's laws. William Duncan, a senior IRS Criminal Intelligence Division investigator, was running headlong into invisible walls that were protecting what appeared to be an open wound in the Department of Justice. How far will the United States government go to protect an operation? Will they kill a case? I think history has shown that that can happen. Did it happen? In my opinion, yes. Duncan, through the Arkansas Attorney General's office, desperately sought funding to continue his investigation into the dark corners of the CIA's activities in Arkansas. But just as Prosecutor Blake had earlier experienced, Bill Clinton wouldn't help. The purse strings funding justice were drawn tight. So Clinton's response to Sarah McClendon about, quote, the state really had next to nothing to do with it, end quote, was another lie. The state, under Clinton's control, helped seal the fate of the MENA scandal by not funding a proper investigation. Even more shocking, when law enforcement failed to shield the citizens of Arkansas from the federal government's reckless disregard for the sovereignty of the state and its laws, a citizens group known as the Arkansas Committee gathered thousands of signatures and went directly to Clinton, demanding he lead the investigation. 
The results of the civilian effort? Continued lies, deceit, and cover-up. What forces could be responsible for compromising the entire system of justice? Bill Clinton certainly knows. He was the governor of Arkansas who allowed the subversion of his state government by the shadowy forces radiating from the Reagan-Bush White House when ex-CIA Director William Casey began using the CIA to illegally conduct secret foreign policy. This serious breach of America's constitutional authority was labeled by the media as Iran-Contra. This documentary will rewrite this dark period in American history and leave you with a gnawing question. Who or what is running this country? Gun running. Mysterious CIA flights. Contra military training. Guerrilla pilot training. Clandestine airdrops. Tons of illegal drugs. Millions of dollars in dirty money. Covert activity in some third world banana republic, right? Wrong. Arkansas, America's own banana republic. The cost of, uh, of living an exciting life is high. Uh, you can't sit in Baton Rouge and uh, go to work from 9 to 5 on Monday through Friday and go to the LSU football games on Saturday night and church on Sunday morning and have an exciting life. That may be exciting to 99% of the population, but to me it's not. And the exciting thing in life to me is to get into a life-threatening situation. Now that's excitement. That was the voice of the late Adler Berryman Seal, pilot extraordinaire, soldier of fortune, drug smuggler, undercover agent for the FBI, DEA, U.S. Customs, and the Central Intelligence Agency. Barry Seal, who was ruthlessly assassinated in Baton Rouge, Louisiana in February 1986, plays a pivotal role. Along with his C-123K military transport plane, he affectionately named the Fat Lady in chronicling the true history of Iran-Contra. This story is about unmasking the deception that was perpetuated upon the American people at a time in the mid-1980s when a small backward state Arkansas became the epicenter of a CIA-like operation designed to do an end run around congressional law. A black operation being backdoored out of the Reagan-Bush White House and set in place in rural western Arkansas under the watchful eyes of then-Governor William Jefferson Clinton. We will expose the ongoing cover-up, which has now spanned three presidential administrations, a cover-up designed to keep the American people in the dark about the unthinkable, that trafficking in cocaine is justified in the pursuit of national security and foreign policy. This documentary is presented from two unique perspectives, from the outside through the eyes of numerous journalists news organizations, and researchers constituting more than an eight-year effort to get to the truth surrounding the CIA's use of Western Arkansas as a staging area for deniable covert activities, and told from the inside through a man who survived the MENA connection and who now, at great personal risk, is willing to set the record straight about the inner workings of the CIA's off-the-shelf, self-sustaining, standalone project known as the Enterprise. This intelligence insider, Terry Reed, has written a best-selling book, Compromised, Clinton, Bush, and the CIA, detailing the inner workings of Ronald Reagan's backdoor foreign policy, mislabeled Iran-Contra by the media. Terry will join us later in this documentary to lead us through this maze of deceit that was the brainchild of George Herbert Walker Bush and which compromised Bill Clinton. So what were Barry Seal's CIA-assigned tasks at MENA? First, the Contras needed guns. Arkansas's National Guard armories had most of the component parts and inventory from which to build guns. All that was lacking was to enlist the manufacturing services of a small clandestine group of trusted Arkansas manufacturing companies, and the recipe would be complete. 
they would build the critical gun parts that, by law, produce a paper trail from the manufacturer to the end user. Only in this case, per CIA instructions, there would be no serial number stamped into the parts and no documentation created to leave an embarrassing trail. Untraceable weapons would seemingly appear from nowhere, and Barry Seal would then fly the munitions to staging areas in Central America with the help of his CIA-provided C-123 cargo plane, the Fat Lady, which had a gross weight capability of 60,000 pounds. Second, the Contras needed skilled pilots, pilots trained in the risky and often deadly business of flying slow and heavily laden cargo planes behind enemy lines for the purpose of resupplying the Contra soldiers on the ground in Nicaragua. As we had learned in Vietnam, guerrilla warfare depends upon a continuous supply of munitions, medical supplies, and food being provided to the foot soldier on the ground. The CIA's Enterprise, based in Honduras, had already procured the planes, planes such as the C-123 Provider and the C-7 Caribou. But potentially catastrophic risks were being taken by piloting the planes with American crews. If an accident or a shootdown did occur, the CIA would have built-in deniability if the planes were piloted by Nicaraguan nationals who were simply trying to liberate their country from the jaws of communism. Being an FAA certified flight instructor, Terry Reed's role with respect to the Contra pilot training was to train the students in multi-engine low-level operations, giving special emphasis to aerial cargo delivery techniques at night while in hostile fire environments. Third, SEAL was tasked with flying the necessary cash back to Arkansas to sustain the operation. All of the sources of SEAL's cash are not yet known. However, a large amount has been traced to the Drug Enforcement Administration in Florida. It appears the DEA was funding the MENA operation with cash seized during drug raids. Were there Contras who relied on the profits of narcotics in order to buy arms and to survive? Yes. It is easy to see how the entire MENA enterprise could evolve into ex-CIA Director Bill Casey's mandate to develop an off-the-shelf, self-sustaining, stand-alone entity that could perform certain activities on behalf of the United States. But what developed as a result of Barry Seal building the machinery to launder unauthorized government money will likely emerge as a money laundering scandal, the likes of which this country has never seen. Back in the summer of 1987, a young television journalist named Teresa Dickey was covering Western Arkansas for Channel 5 out of Fort Smith, a city located 100 miles north of Mena. Well, Miss Dickey had discovered something very strange indeed was or had been going on in and around the Mena airport. Years earlier, the townspeople of Mena had welcomed with open arms and much fanfare the arrival of huge military C-130 aircraft. This was perceived as a boom for the rural Mena economy. Little did the townspeople realize the Central Intelligence Agency had just selected Mena as the staging area for an unauthorized clandestine operation. Initially, Dickey thought that perhaps she was witnessing the results of then-Governor Bill Clinton's aggressive industry recruitment program, a recruitment program designed to drag Arkansas beyond its hillbilly, corncob pipe, and moonshine image by luring out-of-state businesses into Arkansas through promises of state-backed low-interest loans, nearly free land and buildings, coupled with huge tax incentives. Jobs for Arkansans was the young governor's pledge, and Dickey, at first, thought maybe Clinton's plan was working. Bill Clinton's industry recruitment plan had worked all right. Its purpose was to attract industry. But what it had attracted and recruited was the CIA, and along with it, covert operations which had been banned by the United States Congress. But what was peculiar about the MENA airport was the level of sophistication found in all sorts of aircraft maintenance operations situated alongside MENA's single north-south runway. Not to mention that remote MENA was the home of only 5,000 people. High-tech aircraft overhaul facilities located deep in a densely wooded region of the Washita mountain range. Businesses drawing from a labor pool not normally associated with skilled technicians. Well... 
All of this made Dickie suspicious. So what had Dickie found in that isolated little burg known as Mina, Arkansas? A town with no four-lane highway access. A town where everyone either knew each other or was related. A town that was harboring a deep, dark secret. The aftermath of a large-scale CIA black operation that was soon to have a very bright light shone upon it. What had triggered Dickey's suspicion was the extensive security barring access to the airport, as well as the presence of a sea of very large airplanes. Airplanes bearing new paint jobs, foreign registrations, and markings from cities situated long distances from tiny Mina. This prompted her to interview a series of individuals who owned or operated aircraft modification and overhaul facilities at the Mina airport. Dickey focused immediately on why the need for such elaborate security, which included the use of employee ID badges. George Reeb, the owner of a shop that had retrofitted CIA aircraft, responded as follows. Well, you have to tighten up security whenever you're around aircraft because of the uh, safety factor. And I think it's a good idea because, you know, since we're growing so fast, a lot of times you're not familiar with all your employees. And to have badges, you can distinguish who's an employee and who's an employee for another company on the field versus just someone coming in to look around. And you can't quite have that. When asked why he had relocated to Mina from Maryland, Reeb responded. Well, I worked for Fokker Aircraft at the time and was handling used aircraft. And one of the customers told me about Mina, Arkansas, to have aircraft refurbished, and I never heard of Mina, Arkansas before. Dickey inquired about Mina's customer base, and Reeb provided. Had an airplane last week, leave for Australia. One, two weeks prior to that to Australia, we have two more coming that are going to Australia. We send uh, aircraft to Europe, uh, all over the world. Reeb's response about refurbishing aircraft from as far away as Australia should have alerted Dickey that something was amiss. The operating cost to fly a large airplane from Australia to Mina would far exceed any savings realized by having work performed in rural Arkansas. Dickey was then able to penetrate the security of Rich Mountain Aviation, the CIA's primary facility at Mina, the very one that had been used by Barry Seal's organization. Dickey was able to film both Fred Hampton Jr. and Joseph Neville Evans, Seal's trusted mechanics, both of whom were assets of the CIA and DEA. Dickey then interviewed Fred Hampton, and again, the discussion centered on the need for elaborate security. Now the security fence, well, that was something we put up probably about uh, two or three weeks ago. We put it up in anticipation of our first uh, inspection by the military. Being that these are their aircraft and they are used as part of this uh, missile defense system in the Marshall Islands. This was obviously a cover story. Dickey would later discover that office employees of Rich Mountain had been asked to believe concocted cover stories as well. This went as far as one secretary being told that one of Barry Seal's planes had been modified to haul porpoises. Dickey's suspicions solidified into reality a few months later. Through the Iran-Contra hearings in Washington, a connection had been made between the Contras and the MENA operation. This prompted Dickey to dig back into the history of the government's clandestine involvement with Rich Mountain Aviation, a company that was surfacing as one that had performed strange modifications to CIA aircraft. A central figure was also emerging, a man named... Adler Berryman Seal. This is Barry Seal, a highly publicized drug smuggler originally operating out of Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Since 1978, he carried out one of the largest drug smuggling operations between the United States and Central America. In the spring of 1982, Louisiana State Police warned Seal that they would tail him wherever he went in efforts to stop his operation. It's believed that Seal decided to move his operation out of that state after the warning. It was here at Rich Mountain Aviation that authorities believed Barry Seal moved his operation. 
Terry Capehart owned a business at the Mina Airport, and he remembers when he first met Barry Seal in 1981. Of course, I didn't know who Barry Seal was. I'd never heard of the man. And uh, Freddie introduced me to him. Capehart didn't know of Seal's drug background then, but remembers that this man, Joe Evans, former partner of Freddie Hampton's, brought in one of Seal's planes to Rich Mountain Aviation. Evans declined to comment for TV5 News, saying it's his policy to, quote, keep quiet, unquote. Capehart said he began to see more and more of Barry Seal, especially after the spring of 1982. He didn't suspect anything until the Polk County Sheriff called him in with some troubling information. I came uh, in possession of some information that indicated some aircraft being serviced and stored on the uh, airport here was being used in an illegal international operation. Capehart then began noticing some alterations to Barry Seal's aircraft that he says are common to drug smugglers. That I seen myself uh, Freddie and Dwayne Hill, which was an employee of Rich Mountain Aviation, changed the end number on one of the airplanes so that they were both identical. And then that aircraft made a flight. If they got caught or somebody was on them or turned the end number in, they can just take the tape, yank it off the airplane. The airplane's set, say, in, in Florida or Louisiana, wherever. DEA or, or an agency comes up and asks about it, they'll say, hey, this is not the end number. That airplane's sitting in Mean, Arkansas, inside the hangar. A former employee of Rich Mountain Aviation also saw unusual modifications and was given far-fetched reasons for them. What Joe had told me that it was going to be used to transport porpoises on. And he, the other guy just kind of looked at Joe and said, that's a good one. Well, Former had Sheriff Hadaway says he had plenty of evidence to prove a conspiracy, but in 1984, Seal became an informant for the Federal Drug Enforcement Agency. It was then that the sheriff was told to halt his investigation into Seal and Rich Mountain Aviation. Two years later, Seal was murdered by Colombian hitmen for his role as an informant. The grand jury is expected to look into the activities of Barry Seal at Mina Airport prior to 1984. Local investigators believe they have a strong case, but have wondered why it's taken so long to come to court. Tomorrow night, we'll show how the covert smuggling of arms to Contra rebels in Nicaragua may have slowed down one aspect of drug investigations by local authorities. As Dickie just noted, her investigation was now turning up evidence that MENA had been a staging area for arms shipments to Central America. Isn't it interesting? that a freshman journalist like Dickey was already making the MENA connection. As the Iran-Contra hearing in Washington raged on, the teams of seasoned federal investigators should have been following Dickey because she had also made the Fat Lady connection as well. To smuggle arms to Nicaragua from the MENA airport required not only a skilled pilot like Barry Seal, but also a large military transport plane. Dickey had learned that Barry Seal's CIA-provided C-123K military cargo plane had been based at Rich Mountain Aviation, and this caused her to file part two of her series. This man, the late Barry Seal, was a known drug smuggler, whom authorities believed moved his drug smuggling base of operation from Baton Rouge, Louisiana, to Mena, Arkansas in 1982. In 1984, he parked this plane at Rich Mountain Aviation at Mena's airport. I know that one time um, Mr. Seals was working in it and he had some ropes around it and we were instructed not to go near the plane while Mr. Seals was in there working. I was informed that this aircraft had been used to smuggle some cocaine into the United States. Then subsequent to that, some information that it may have been used to uh, in an operation that was used to embarrass the Nicaraguan government. With this information, the former sheriff sought a court order to confiscate the plane in June of 1984. Everything was lined up, but then he received a telephone call from a drug enforcement agency supervisor from Miami named Robert Jara. He finally disclosed to me and asked me not to uh, confiscate the airplane, told me that if I did, that I would just be ordered to give it back to him, that in fact the DEA did have a large financial interest in the aircraft. At this point, Hadaway's investigation into Barry Seal's drug smuggling activities at Rich Mountain Aviation came to a screeching halt. 
Six months later, Seal's plane left Mina. The next time the sheriff heard about it, it had crashed in Nicaragua during a gun-running mission to the Contra rebels. Hadaway's run-in with the DEA would have gone unnoticed, except for an April 1987 broadcast on CBS's West 57th Street called The CIA Connection, Drugs for Guns. Do you really believe the government decided to get into the drug business in order to pay for the Contra? The American government. Uh, as incredulous as it may sound, I, I believe that not only decided to get into it, I think they orchestrated the whole thing. I need more on that. Bring it up a bit. Go ahead. There you go. These two Fort Smith men saw the story and were discussing it in a local bar. An assistant U.S. attorney overheard their conversation and told him his office was working on a case just like that. He mentioned that their office had a case and that in the process of that, they had contacted some people in Florida for some assistance and that another agency in Florida had contacted their office and told them to drop the case to get off of it. It bothers me to think that a competent attorney's office could be restrained from doing its job. It's, uh, that's what bothers me. These men also say the attorney said the case in question involved Barry Seal activities in the MENA area. The Congressional Subcommittee on Crime has now begun its own investigation into the MENA connection. Tomorrow night, we'll show you how a probe into a money laundering scheme in MENA seems to have gone nowhere. Drugs, guns, money laundering, cover-up. The CIA's MENA connection appeared to be reaching critical mass. A federal grand jury was preparing to expose the whole seedy affair. Dickie was following a trail she probably thought would lead to a Pulitzer Prize in investigative journalism. Here she was in rural western Arkansas, covering a federal grand jury proceeding that was destined to prove that the CIA had not only violated congressional law by shipping arms to the Contras, but had also allowed their black operations aircraft to transport cocaine into the United States. The issue of a drug smuggling conspiracy revolves around this convicted drug smuggler, the late Barry Seal. Former SEAL pilots spoke at a grand jury this week about whether their former boss had moved his operation from Baton Rouge, Louisiana to Rich Mountain Aviation in Mena, Arkansas. One pilot who testified told TV5 News Rich Mountain Aviation was simply used by Barry SEAL and SEAL didn't involve the company in his drug smuggling activities. But a couple years ago, other witnesses testified at a grand jury about another possible aspect of this conspiracy, money laundering and nothing happened. Catherine Gann used to work as a secretary for Freddie Hampton of Rich Mountain Aviation. She says she handled lots of cash for her boss, but sometimes in an extraordinary manner. I was told to deposit the large amounts of cash in uh, amounts of less than $10,000. Even if we had fifteen dollars or $20,000, I would go to two separate banks and deposit um, less than 10000 at one bank and less than 10000 at another. What she's talking about is money laundering or structuring deposits to avoid filling out one of these Internal Revenue Service forms called a Currency Transaction Report. I asked Fred Hampton why he wanted me to deposit it this way, and he said, IRS won't get this. We won't have to pay taxes on it. Union Bank of Mina is one of the banks that Kathy Gann was told to deposit large amounts of cash. One Union Bank employee told TV5 News that on one occasion, a former bank official divided the cash for Rich Mountain Aviation and personally went to different tellers and had each of them deposit $10,000 into the Rich Mountain Aviation account. Catherine Gann gave testimony to an IRS agent about the illegal practice, but found that when she appeared before a grand jury, it asked no questions about the money laundering. When I left there, I was wondering, as I walked down the hall, I wondered, well, why did they bring me up here? In the meantime, the fact that she gave testimony has caused her to live in fear. I, I kept waiting and waiting to hear from somebody, and I was scared all this time. I didn't know what was going to happen to me, and, you know, I knew that 
that his truck had been outside my house. I was scared for my girls. People close to this issue wonder why such a cut-and-dried case failed to produce indictments. The former Polk County the, Sheriff has lost faith in the process of justice. They really have, uh, do not have a great deal of confidence in, in the function of the federal criminal justice system at this time. But even if this grand jury fails to produce any indictments, other law enforcement officials say they will continue their separate investigations. In Mina, I'm Teresa Dickey reporting for the news people. You're probably wondering, how many indictments did the Fort Smith grand jury hand up? Answer, none. But Dickey noted that several other law enforcement officials were committed to continuing their investigations into the Mina connection if the grand jury bore no fruit and investigate they did. In fact, their efforts triggered the interest of out-of-state media. Mina is a town of patriots and pickups, a town of 5,000 in the mountains of western Arkansas, a place that would seem as far away from American foreign policy as a place could get. And yet, one little airport on the southern edge of town is managing to raise questions that extend far beyond the city limits. A thousand miles away from Mina, here in Washington, there are investigators for both the House and the Senate who would like to know what's going on at that little airport in western Arkansas. As Oliver North's public battle over government secrets and the illegal supply of weapons to the Nicaraguan Contras is waged in Washington, congressional investigators in recent months have tried to learn if Mena, Arkansas was an illegal staging area for shipping guns to the U.S.-backed Contra rebels. This is a strange story. The facts already known are bizarre enough. What Unit 5 has been able to learn makes this story stranger still. It all begins in 1982, when this man, Adler Berryman Seal, showed up in Mena, Arkansas. My top load paid me one and a half million dollars for a single trip. Barry Seal was a drug smuggler, an extraordinary multi-million dollar a year drug smuggler, who with the help of several associates kept and serviced his drug planes in a hangar at the Mena airport. Those planes, according to investigators, were illegally modified with extra fuel tanks and instruments in order to fly long-distance drug missions to Central and South America. Barry Seal paid his associates for those modifications with tens of thousands of dollars in cash, money which, according to investigators, was illegally laundered by Seal's associates at banks in Mina. Yeah, I'm pleading guilty. But when Barry Seal was finally caught in 1984, investigators for the FBI, the IRS, and other agencies of law enforcement were told little or nothing about a special deal he had made with the Federal Drug Task Force headed by then Vice President George Bush. The deal? The government kept Barry Seal out of jail, and in exchange, Seal became a drug informant and helped put in jail some of his own associates in the international drug trade. But that wasn't all that Barry Seal did. Russell Welch, criminal investigator for the Arkansas State Police. Did Barry Seal ever say to you, I work for the CIA? He said he was working, had worked for the CIA. Unit 5 has learned in the early 1980s, even before his arrest, Seal had bought one of his planes from a CIA front, Air America. The plane was used by Seal for drug smuggling, and the CIA company was paid in the traditional drug dealer fashion of $300,000 in cash. According to this confidential FBI teletype obtained by Unit 5, one of Seal's associates said he was maintaining Seal's aircraft at the Mena airport for the CIA. So what was Barry Seal actually doing? One federal agent under uh, very uh, strict confidence uh, told me that it was assumed within his agency Barry Seal was uh, carrying guns to Central America in exchange, was bringing drugs back on a free ride. Russell Welch of the Arkansas State Police was one of dozens of investigators who for years had been tracking Barry Seal and his associates. As these documents obtained by Unit 5 indicate, the FBI, the IRS, Customs, and the Attorney General of Louisiana formed just a partial list of those who wanted some answers. They didn't get them. Internal FBI documents indicate investigators were told not to look into any of Seal's activities that occurred before his 1984 plea agreement. So, blocked from seeking indictments against Seal, investigators sought indictments against Seal's associates at the Mena airport for allegedly aiding in the drug smuggling and for alleged IRS violations. So far, no indictments have been produced. At the end of this year, the statute of limitations will run out on those alleged crimes. 
As for Barry Seal, time ran out in 1986 when he was assassinated in Louisiana by Colombian drug dealers. Some of Seal's secrets died with him, but some of those secrets today remain guarded by the National Security Council, the agency for which Oliver North worked. The NSC has blocked a recent congressional request to examine the relationship of drug smuggling to American foreign policy in Central America. As a citizen, America didn't get to stay in court. A Chicago journalist Carol Moran unearthed a whole new facet of the MENA operation. As her investigation continued, she connected Mina to Washington and discovered that a major portion of Oliver North's Contra assistance program took place in a wooded mountainous region north of the Mina Airport. Watch part two of Marin's special. Angola, where the United States has supported rebels against the Marxist government. South Africa, where the United States has walked a tightrope between the minority white government and the majority black population. Central America, where the United States has tried to overthrow the leftist government of Nicaragua and prop up the centrist government of El Salvador. Three critical areas for U.S. foreign policy that seem very distant from the concerns of a small community in western Arkansas, but maybe not. Mina, Arkansas is a small town in the mountains along the Arkansas-Oklahoma border. It has no interstate highway. It takes some effort to get here. But some people, some very interesting people in recent years apparently made that effort. I don't think that there's really anything that we can pin down about them. I believe there's truth in every story. The rumors and gossip surround two small airfields. The first is the Mina Airport, where this giant C-130 military cargo plane, tail number N4469P, arrived one day last year. It is a huge plane for a small airport, a plane that originally belonged to the Royal Australian Air Force. Curiously, around the same time, a group of Australians arrived to work at the airport, telling investigators like Russell Welch of the Arkansas State Police some strange things. You've spoken with some of the Australians at the airport, correct? Yes. And some of them have told you they're part of a CIA operation? Yes, it didn't seem to be too much of a secret. An Australian at that time told Welch the C-130 would soon be on its way to Angola, mission undisclosed. Unit 5 has learned of two current federal probes at the airport. U.S. Customs in Houston is investigating possible violations of the Neutrality Act, whether or not this plane, considered to be a weapon of war, might be on its way into the hands of South Africa. The second investigation by Arkansas Congressman Bill Alexander probes, among other things, whether or not the CIA within the past year and a half contracted with various partners to transport arms to Central America, allowing them to bring drugs back to MENA with distribution in Miami or New York. The mayor of MENA, Jerry Montgomery, doesn't believe any of it. That's hard for me to believe that, that MENA, Arkansas was used. But there's more. Down a winding dirt road, back in the mountains where even the locals can get lost, resides yet another mystery. Now, this landing strip is a curious thing. It exists in an isolated mountain valley in the middle of nowhere when there already is an airport just 11 miles from here. So why was 2,700 feet of runway installed here? Why was this landing strip built? And what was it built for? One person who thinks he knows the answer is Gene Wheaton, a former criminal investigator for the U.S. Army who has done his own investigation. They were training pilots to make night flights and takeoffs and landings of strips that had no lighting, no air control, so forth. Wheaton's deposition came last year in an unsuccessful civil lawsuit against Oliver North and other principals in the Iran-Contra scandal. Oliver North won that battle and now in Washington fights the criminal charges against him. It is a fight over what government secrets should stay secret. In some ways, on a smaller scale, that's the same battle going on in Mena, Arkansas where investigators from a variety of agencies for a number of years have asked questions of the government and have received few answers. The people of MENA themselves continue to debate whether or not their small town has some ongoing role in American foreign policy. I don't uh, see how it could have been kept a secret. There are definitely fishy things going on, and, and there's a lot of uh, cover-up. 
So, in the mid to late 1980s, news of the MENA connection spilled forth. This may lead one to wonder if the media simply dropped the MENA story after the aftermath of the Iran-Contra scandal died down. Quite the opposite. Time and time again, the story would leap into the headlines of predominantly Arkansas newspapers. Arkansas journalists, law enforcement officials, and citizens groups would try in vain to advance the investigations, but an invisible force seemed to be keeping the lid on Arkansas's Pandora's box. Then, in 1992, during the presidential campaign, after the name of Bill Clinton was thrust into the mainstream media, a renewed interest in MENA surfaced as throngs of journalists rushed to Little Rock to investigate the obscure young governor who was seeking the Democratic Party's nomination. Countless reporters dug, probed, and pried into the layers of lies, deceit, and distortions that by then effectively interred MENA's dark secrets. Russell Welch of the Arkansas State Police and Bill Duncan, by then an investigator with the Arkansas Attorney General's office, were interviewed time and time again as the media slowly began to understand that a large-scale, high-profile CIA operation had in fact taken place on Arkansas soil on Bill Clinton's watch as governor. Arkansas Democratic Congressman Bill Alexander renewed his efforts to get the truth out the truth that even he had been stonewalled as his office attempted to dissect the MENA story. Then, in April of 1992, as the pressure cooker containing the MENA scandal seemed ready to burst, with the resulting steam most assuredly scalding Bill Clinton and destroying his political career, Time magazine came to the rescue. Time's full-page story which savagely attacked the credibility of Terry Reid and ridiculed nearly everyone associated with the MENA investigation, effectively nailed the lid once again on the CIA's box of dirty secrets. What the Time article failed to tell the reader, however, was Time's investigative journalist Richard Behar, who wrote the story Anatomy of a Smear, was actually in Arkansas helping to undermine the investigative efforts of other credible journalists. Behar had discovered that the news magazine The Nation was actually corroborating portions of Terry Reid's story concerning weapons parts manufacturing. Through a liable suit in federal court launched by Terry Reid against Time magazine, the following tape-recorded conversation was obtained. In it, Behar is conversing with Bill Clinton's friend Webster Hubble, who was then working with Hillary Clinton at the Rose Law Firm in Little Rock. In the tape, Behar is alerting Hubble of an active media investigation into Hubble's father-in-law's manufacturing company, P.O.M., in Russellville, Arkansas. Behar is warning Hubble that his brother-in-law, Skeeter Ward, is divulging classified information to the magazine The Nation. Remember, according to CIA insider Terry Reid, it was P.O.M. on the surface a manufacturer of parking meters who was building weapons parts for the CIA through an agreement with Ivers Johnson Firearms, a CIA proprietary company situated in Jacksonville, Arkansas. Well, listen, can I, can I make a recommendation to you off the record? Sure. Um, and this is, I, I don't particularly want these guys to know that I'm on this story. Uh -huh. But it seems to me they're acting a little irresponsibly. The Nation newspaper? Uh-huh. Apparently, I heard it through the grapevine, they had an interview with Skeeter. Uh-huh. And, shouldn't be talking to them. And supposedly, Skeeter told them that you guys have done exit cones on nuclear weapons. FPOM. Which he, he wouldn't have said that. He knows better. Well, that's just the thing. Yeah. I don't know why it would come back to me through different channels that yeah. nuclear weapons. Yeah. Unless the story's taking a life of its own. Yeah. What you may want to do is give a ring to the nation. Yeah. And and speak to whoever's doing the story and clear it up before they put it in their damn newspaper. Yeah. Yeah. But you didn't hear it from me. I appreciate it. I really do. So why did Time Magazine use its vast resources to protect Bill Clinton? 
maybe the fact that Bill Clinton's friend and former Oxford roommate, Strobe Talbot, who was then Time's editor-at-large, played a role. Did Mr. Talbot receive a reward for short-circuiting the investigation? The perception is certainly there. Mr. Talbot joined the Clinton administration in 1993 and is now the number two man in the Department of State. Is it possible that an organization that's perceived as credible as Time magazine is in effect under the control of the CIA? A CIA investigator supplying sworn testimony for the Reed versus Time libel suit after being asked to evaluate Time's article on Mina said in an affidavit he believed the article was an obvious disinformation tool. So, with Time magazine's help, it appeared that Mina would die and the truth would never come out. But the government had underestimated the determination of Terry Reed. Terry and his wife Janice were seeking complete vindication in federal court in Little Rock as a result of being the victims of a manufactured crime. Although silenced and gagged within the federal court system for nearly two and a half years, the Reeds emerged victorious. Terry was acquitted of all charges by a federal judge in Wichita, Kansas, charges involving the theft of an airplane, and Janice's case was eventually dropped but they both wanted to see those who had needlessly ensnared them in the manufactured crime brought to justice. The Reeds and their attorneys saw this blatant misuse of the criminal justice system being used solely as a way to destroy their credibility, thus insulating important politicians from the MENA scandal. The Reeds had filed a civil rights lawsuit in July 1991 against Bill Clinton's chief of security, Arkansas State Police Captain Raymond Buddy Young. It was quite obvious from the court record that Young, working in concert with others, had helped to orchestrate the wrongful criminal indictment brought against them. Terry knew that properly trying the civil rights case would require reopening the entire MENA story. Power brokers of both political parties were desperate to ensure this didn't happen. As the Reed case simmered in a court file in Little Rock, the media was beginning to probe into the financial dealings of Bill and Hillary Clinton and their friends. By early 1994, a new term, Whitewater, would consume the headlines and refocus the media's attention to Arkansas. And this time, reporters would attempt to better explain Bill Clinton's meteoric rise to power. Once again, that four-letter word, M-E-N-A would resurface. This time, the media would be armed with the information detailed in Terry Reed's book, Compromised. The reporters were beginning to notice a shocking similarity between the players of the MENA story and those of the Whitewater scandal. The connection Reed had made between people involved with the CIA's enterprise and some very prominent Arkansans caused CBS News to do an eight-minute story on the scandal that just won't go away. A civil war in Central America, drug smuggling in Arkansas, President Ronald Reagan and President Bill Clinton, the subject of tonight's Eye on America. But first, a little background. In the early 80s, a war was underway for control of Nicaragua. On one side, the ruling Marxist regime, the Sandinistas. On the other side, rebel forces, the Contras, labeled by the Reagan administration as pro-democracy freedom fighters. A base of support for the Contra movement, remote western Arkansas. Correspondent Bill Plant has been investigating for tonight's Eye on America. 1983, Ronald Reagan was president, Bill Clinton was governor. And little Mina, Arkansas, changed from a quiet town to a center for drug smuggling and reported Contra support activity. In the middle of it all, this man, admitted dope smuggler Barry Seal. He started doing business with the Ochoa family in Columbia, hauling his uh, dope. Arkansas State Trooper Russell Welch investigated Seal's organization. Each trip would have uh, 250 to 350 pounds of cocaine. Uh, he stated that he made uh, a uh, million dollars in one trip alone. Seal built this hangar at Rich Mountain Aviation at the MENA airport for his high-tech smuggling planes used to fly guns to the Contras and more than 20 tons of cocaine into the U.S. over three and a half years. 
former IRS agent William Duncan traced some of Seal's drug profits laundered through MENA banks. We had direct testimony from people who were involved in the money laundering operation. We had testimony from people at banks who observed the transactions. And Barry Seal had another agenda. Pilot Terry Reed claims Seal hired him in 1983 to train Contra pilots at this remote airstrip north of MENA. I was involved in the flight training aspects of upgrading Nicaraguan uh, freedom fighters to make them uh, capable of flying combat aircraft. The airstrip was built by SEAL's organization and also reportedly used to train Contra ground troops. In 1984, SEAL was arrested for smuggling and was turned by the Drug Enforcement Administration into an informant and smuggler for the government. With help from both Lieutenant Colonel Oliver North and the CIA, SEAL pulled off a spectacular drug sting. He flew his own C-123 to Nicaragua, where he took these pictures of Sandinistas helping load Colombian cocaine onto his plane. After the sting, SEAL flew the C-123 to the MENA airport, where it sat for a year. It was later shot down over Nicaragua, filled with guns for the Contras. By late 1985, Agent Duncan had gathered substantial evidence of alleged money laundering against SEAL's associates Fred Hampton and Joe Evans of Rich Mountain Aviation. What happened when you tried to make this case before a grand jury? I was never asked to present the evidence to a grand jury, ever. The evidence was in this 24-count draft indictment prepared for the federal grand jury in January of 1986, but the grand jury never saw it. The United States Department of Justice did not pursue the cases, did not present the evidence of money laundering to the grand jury. Former U.S. Attorney Mike Fitzhugh, who handled the MENA cases, says that was because Agent Duncan asked for a delay. I consented to his request that, uh, uh, that the matter not be presented at the grand jury session meeting in January of 86. Agent Duncan says he made no such request. That is absolutely false. An FBI internal memo from early February 1986 obtained by CBS News says Fitzhugh was withholding presentation of the indictment, but there is no mention of a request from IRS agent Duncan for a delay. I would have been the last person in the world to have tried to delay evidence going to the grand jury. We asked Attorney Fitzhugh if he was told to delay the indictment by the Reagan Justice Department. There was not any type of pressure or influence uh, put on, on me or anyone in my office that I'm aware of. For two more years, Trooper Welch watched as Fitzhugh's federal grand jury failed to return indictments in the MENA cases. It was a slow realization uh, over a period of time that, no, the, this isn't like any other case. Uh, it's not going anywhere. Uh, we're, uh, we are wasting our time. By 1988, Trooper Welch and Agent Duncan had given up on the Reagan Justice Department, but not on their investigation. They had hopes that the state of Arkansas could impanel a grand jury to hear evidence of money laundering, drug smuggling, and conspiracy. They went directly to then-Governor Bill Clinton. That part of the story in a moment. Back now with more of our Eye on America investigation of drugs, guns, and money laundering in Arkansas in the 1980s. By 1988, law enforcement officials investigating the case had given up on the federal government, pinning their hopes for prosecution on the state judicial system. Correspondent Bill Plant picks up the story from there. By 1988, almost everyone in Arkansas had heard about MENA. It was here at Rich Mountain Aviation that authorities believed Barry Seal moved his operation. There were news reports about smuggling and Contra support activity around the MENA airport. Congress had begun an inquiry, and the media covered it all. At the Polk County Courthouse in MENA, Trooper Welch and Agent Duncan turned to County Prosecutor Charles Black for help. And when it became apparent that uh, nothing was going to be done on the federal level, that's when I began more actively pursuing it. Prosecutor Black, a Clinton supporter, met with the governor and handed him a letter requesting money for a state grand jury on MENA. His response to me was that he would uh, get a man, something to the effect that he would get a man on it and would get word back to me. And uh, I never heard back. Years later, Clinton said he offered $25,000 to Prosecutor Black's boss to fund a grand jury. But Charles Black and his boss claim they never heard about any offer of money from Governor Clinton. 
I believe Bill Clinton's an honest, respectable man, and I, I have to believe that he did that. But the fact is, I never got that word myself. But the MENA issue would not die. I don't think that the story of Iran-Contra has yet been fully told. In 1988, Arkansas Congressman Bill Alexander asked the General Accounting Office to investigate connections between the MENA airport, Lieutenant Colonel Oliver North's Contra operations, and Panamanian dictator Manuel Noriega. Alexander says the National Security Council, in this letter, refused to cooperate, challenging GAO's authority and effectively killing the investigation. Then MENA became an issue in the 1990 Attorney General's race in Arkansas between Republican Asa Hutchinson and Democrat Winston Bryant. Sources tell CBS News that Governor Clinton's aide, Betsy Wright, asked Bryant to stay away from the MENA issue. Wright denies it. In 1991, Congressman Alexander got the Arkansas State Police a federal grant to reopen the MENA investigation. Sources tell CBS News that Governor Clinton's staff was involved in the discussions about what to do with that grant. The money went to State Police Chief Tommy Goodwin. That money was discussed around here for quite a while, <laughs> and, and we finally said, we'll just turn it back. We don't have anything to, to spend it on. But what happened to the state case? Nothing happened to the state case. A grand jury was never called. Uh, uh, it, just, it just died. I maintained uh, a certain amount of faith that at some point the problem would be solved. That never occurred. Has not occurred. Has yet. not occurred to this date. Mary Seal's organization helped the Contras, smuggled tons of cocaine, and laundered drug profits through Arkansas. Why did the Reagan Justice Department fail to prosecute? Did Bill Clinton, then the governor, fail to provide leadership and support for a successful state prosecution? The White House says he did all he could. But Agent Duncan, Trooper Welts, Prosecutor Black, and a lot of other people are still looking for answers. In Washington, this is Bill Plant for Eye on America. Why the Arkansas grand jury was not successful in bringing forth indictments, and why the media was unsuccessful in detailing the inner workings of the CIA's operations, requires the insight and comments of Terry Reed. Now, come meet a spy, a man who lived this sordid story alongside Barry Seal, a man who has now severed his relationship with the intelligence community in order to expose this cover-up. Hello there, I'm Terry Reed. Let me tell you a little about myself. I'm a family man, businessman, and Vietnam veteran whose life got a little off course as the result of the so-called Iran-Contra affair. But just to set the record straight, I'm not a drug trafficker, and I've never knowingly associated with anyone who is. I was, however, recruited and freely enlisted in the so-called enterprise for the purpose of assisting the Contras. I did so purely for patriotic reasons, although others I worked with obviously had selfish agendas. Be that as it may, I have no regrets in helping to rid Nicaragua of the communist backed Sandinista regime. I would do it all again. I'm participating in the production of this documentary to show you that the real Nicaraguan guerrilla support effort took place in Arkansas through a very sophisticated CIA network set in place by the Reagan White House and monitored by Bill Clinton's gubernatorial administration. I know this because I was part of that support effort. In fact, after viewing this documentary, I'm confident you will conclude that through the efforts of Ronald Reagan's Attorney General Edwin Meese, phase one of the deceit began. Let me explain. By Meese divulging the unauthorized weapons shipments to our enemy Iran, and accusing a lowly Marine Lieutenant Colonel of seizing the reins of foreign policy. <laughs> well, that act in itself was a clever diversion. The media went for the bait and immediately labeled the entire fiasco the Iran-Contra affair. But instead of scurrying east out of Washington and focusing their investigative efforts on the Middle East, the hostage crisis, and the diversion of weapon sales profits to the Contras, reporters should have gone west to Arkansas. But why should you believe me? Let me tell you a little about my life within the intelligence community and how a starry-eyed and patriotic young man from Missouri got swept into a world of espionage, secret foreign policy, deniable operations, and deceit. To begin with, 
Harry S. Truman was and still is my personal hero. I had the very good fortune of meeting Mr. Truman when I was 17 years old, and that occasion left a lasting imprint in my mind. You know, Missouri politics, religion, duty, honor, and commitment to family and community greatly influenced my upbringing. As the eldest of six children, I can most assuredly say that my father, himself a veteran of World War II, raised me and my three brothers with a clear understanding that we owed a debt to our country, that we had to repay our nation for the privilege of living in freedom. And being raised in Carthage, Missouri, a town of 10,000, a true Norman Rockwell setting, only 21 miles from the birthplace of President Truman, instilled in me a set of rural Midwestern values that I cherish and protect to this day. When my country called during the Vietnam War, I responded. I felt it was time to apply the military skills taught me from four years of Army ROTC training. After all, it was Harry Truman who had commissioned the ROTC program in Carthage that I had been fortunate enough to serve as a cadet company commander. After taking the military oath at the induction center in Kansas City, Missouri, our government placed me in Air Force Intelligence. Upon graduation from a whole series of intelligence curriculums, I was then handpicked to serve in Defense Secretary Robert S. McNamara's ultra top secret unit designated Task Force Alpha based in the remote northeast jungles of Thailand. From there, the U.S. Air Force orchestrated a secret air and ground war in Laos and Cambodia. Our mission was to be the deniable link between authorized military operations and the unauthorized activities of the Central Intelligence Agency. We assigned Air America the tasks that were just quite frankly too unthinkable for the U.S. military to conduct. Now this was my introduction to black or deniable activities. In the course of serving eight years within the Air Force's intelligence community and pulling two and one half years of duty in Southeast Asia, I met and worked with some of the people who would later surface in the so-called Iran-Contra affair. In fact, it was in Southeast Asia that I met and worked with a man named William Cooper, the Air America pilot who died in the crash of an American cargo plane that was shot down in Nicaragua October 5th of 1986, the crash that exposed the CIA's efforts to violate the so-called Bolin Amendments, you know, the laws Congress passed to limit American assistance to the Contras. But after becoming disillusioned with the peacetime military, I elected to be separated from the military in 1976. I then enrolled in a pilot training curriculum in Southwest Missouri and graduated three years later with nearly every available aviation license and rating known. Then by sheer coincidence, I entered an industry laden with agents of the KGB and those of our so-called allied Japan who were actually attempting to steal American defense technology. So it was in Oklahoma City in 1980, while working as executive vice president of a high technology trading company, that I was recruited by the FBI's counterintelligence division to monitor and help disrupt the efforts of agents of the Kremlin who had penetrated the American machine tool industry. These activities and adventures, I might add, required me to travel behind the Iron Curtain not only to sow some seeds of deceit, but to pirate some Soviet technology as well. Now, where I feel this story gets interesting is later while working under deep cover on the now famous Toshiba case, the one involving the theft and sale of American nuclear submarine technology to the KGB by Japan's Toshiba Machine Tool Company. I was, it was then that I was put into play with an agent of the CIA who carried the code name of John Cathy. Now this took place in Oklahoma City in early 1982. And Agent John Cathy's real name is Oliver Lawrence North, the same Marine Lieutenant Colonel later accused of taking over the Department of State by Ronald Reagan's administration. As North and I worked together, we shared memories of not only our combat experiences in Southeast Asia, but rehashed our mutual disdain for Congress as well. The same Congress that had put us as young soldiers in harm's way and then sat back and debated the morality of it all. But North also shared with me what he referred to as a secret Reagan plan to destroy the USSR. He continuously referred to Russia 
in our conversations as a failed colonial power that the timing was right to incite revolution within the Russian colonies. It was through these efforts, North confided, that the CIA felt Russia could collapse economically. Then North asked if I was interested in helping to deal what he called a death blow to the evil empire that it kept its finger on the nuclear trigger throughout my lifetime. I can say this, I enthusiastically jumped on board what is now referred to as the secret Reagan agenda. It was then, through my rather intimate relationship with North, that I was quietly tapped to support the Contra effort. North arranged for me to be introduced to a man named Adler Berriman Seal. Barry Seal was an asset of the CIA, and the man tasked with setting up the necessary facilities to keep the Contras alive in body and soul, as Ronald Reagan had instructed Oliver North. Now that brings this story to Mena, Arkansas because it was in MENA that Barry Seal had set up operations to covertly support and modify aircraft belonging to various federal agencies. Hey, but enough about my background. Besides, I'm getting bored just sitting here talking. You know, Barry Seal referred to me, as he did to himself, as a calculated risk taker, and I suppose that sums up the nature of most pilots. I've also been accused of being a rather action-oriented individual so I've got an idea. Let's leave this stuffy office and head on out to the airport. You know, airplanes play a major role in this story. In fact, airplanes leave the so-called trail of truth that we'll follow as we lay open the MENA connection for public inspection. As you can see, I'm now dressed more appropriate to that, the role of a flight instructor. Uh, this is the way I dressed as I trained the Nicaraguan pilots in uh, near MENA, Arkansas. We're also filming now in the mall factory, mall aircraft factory in Georgia for a reason. That reason being the mall aircraft, aircraft such as this one, came to bear heavy in the Iran-Contra story. As uh, Richard Secord, Oliver North, and the CIA went shopping for small aircraft to use in Nicaragua in a hostile, very hostile combat environment, they came to the mall aircraft company because Maul had a proven track record and built a very unique aircraft, an aircraft very suited to be used in rough terrain, unimproved conditions, primarily because of the what is referred to as a conventional landing gear configuration using a tail wheel in lieu of a nose wheel. The Maul aircraft, in addition to being a high-performance STOL, or short takeoff and landing airplane, afforded the capability of delivering the necessary supplies and munitions uh, to the guerrilla war action in Nicaragua as the Contras fought the Sandinista soldiers. My role in all of this, of course, was to use my flight instructor credentials and expertise, pass along my aviation skills to approximately 24 Nicaraguan nationals so that they could, in fact, liberate their own country so that they could go back and replace the CIA's efforts, the CIA's efforts to keep the Contras alive, body and soul, as uh, Ronald Reagan said, to keep the Contras in the field, supplied with munitions, regardless of what Congress, the American Congress said. I'm not here to debate the rightness or wrongness of our efforts in this documentary I simply want to convince you, the viewer, that this went on and that this aircraft had a very instrumental role in all of that. In my book, Compromised, uh, Clinton Bush and the CIA, I refer to a, uh, a time in 1984 in which a friend of mine, uh, William Cooper, a pilot that I'd known from uh, Thailand, an Air America pilot, flew an aircraft very similar to this aircraft into the North Little Rock Airport. He was flying that day with a, another Arkansan pilot, a man named Buzz Sawyer. Buzz Sawyer was from Magnolia, Arkansas, and Buzz had a distinguished career in aviation. Uh, his roots also went back to that of Air America, Thailand, the CIA, the place where a lot of us young, patriotic people from the Midwest cut our teeth in these deep, dark secrets that are still secrets for the most part of what actually went on in Southeast Asia. 
Uh, little did I know that was the last time I would see Buzz Sawyer. In fact, it was Bill Cooper at the controls of the C-123K, the fat lady, that was shot down in Nicaragua October 5th, 1986, thus exposing the whole Iran-Contra affair. In the right seat in that C-123K, the fat lady was Mr. Sawyer as well. I lost two friends that day. I tell you this story now because I think it's important for the American people to understand what we did in and around Mena, Arkansas, and why I chose to cross that line and get involved in a very deep black operation in and around MENA, an operation that neither the Democratic Party nor the Republicans want to accept ever happened. So the Democrats and Republicans don't want to accept the MENA operation ever happened, huh? That's the problem. A lot of important people who have a lot to lose would like to convince you that MENA never happened. But it did happen. And one very large, undeniable piece of evidence that MENA was CIA-backed is the airplane the government provided Barry Seal so he could fly tons of munitions from Arkansas to Central America. That airplane, the Fairchild C-123, nicknamed the Fat Lady, connects the dots between the CIA's Air America in Southeast Asia, MENA, Arkansas, the CIA's proprietary airline in Miami, Florida, named Southern Air Transport, and the Iran-Contra affair through the so-called Hassenfuss shootdown. That was the day Barry Seal's fat lady crashed in Nicaragua, and the Reagan-Bush administration could no longer deny they were bypassing the law of Congress and the will of the American people. Let's go back to the airport. Terry would like to show you an airplane similar to an old friend of his. He called her the Fat Lady, and it's time for her to sing. And what a story she has to tell. The real story of Iran-Contra. The one more appropriately entitled, The Mina Connection. Barry Seal was provided a provider, very appropriately, a C-123K that had been stored in an Air Force museum at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, Ohio. That aircraft, the C-123K that Barry Seal affectionately nicknamed the Fat Lady, becomes the common thread that sews together several black operations in a fairly dark period of American history in the mid-1980s. You see, I was at Mena, Arkansas the day Barry Seal first flew in his C-123K, the fat lady. The C-123K was a very instrumental aircraft in that it had the payload capability to fly munitions from Arkansas to staging areas in Central America, primarily Honduras and El Salvador. The interesting part of the story is these were weapons that were drawn from National Guard armories in Arkansas at a time in which Bill Clinton was commander-in-chief of the Arkansas National Guard. Some of these weapons were then mated with secret component parts that were being built by CIA contractors in Arkansas, component parts that would, in effect, bear no serial numbers, component parts that would become untraceable. Little did we all know that a C-123K, such as this one, would be shot down by a Soviet SA-7 handheld missile on October the 5th, 1986, and thereby shed a lot of unwanted light on a very secret operation, a secret operation backed by the CIA to bypass the will of Congress and supply the Contras in their effort to defeat the Sandinista regime. As you can probably tell, Terry Reed loves airplanes and flying is one of his passions. His ability to transfer his flying skills to others 
is why Barry Seal and the CIA hired him. But Terry's story is much larger than just that of a flight instructor. He joined Oliver North's MENA operation with bona fide intelligence credentials provided by the United States Air Force. For this reason, Terry was entrusted to orbit with some pretty heavy hitters coming from both sides of the equation, both government and civilian. Let's catch up with Terry and see if he will tell us the names of some of these heavy hitters in the MENA story. Terry, in your book, Compromised, you talk about being sponsored into Bill Clinton's inner circle shortly after moving to Little Rock in 1983. That's right. You know, my background's manufacturing. And uh, I'd moved to Arkansas and co-founded a business, an ultralight manufacturing firm, with a man named Seth Ward. Now, Seth refers to himself as a Little Rock industrialist. He is, in fact, a self-made multimillionaire. And Seth is now emerging, though, as sort of the mystery man behind the whole Whitewater affair. Seth has a son-in-law named Webb Hubble. Webb Hubble, of course, worked at the uh, Rose Law Firm and, uh, in fact, right adjacent to Hillary Clinton's office. So, in fact, it was through Seth Ward and Webb Hubble that my wife Janice and I were introduced into the social circles of Little Rock, Arkansas. Now, is that the same Seth Ward whose name has been associated with Madison Guarantee, the Little Rock savings and loan controlled at one time by James McDougall, the, the so-called friend of Bill and Hillary Clinton who who brought them into the Whitewater Land Development Project? Yeah, that is the same Seth Ward, all right. And, of course, his son-in-law, Webb Hubble, is the man who worked side-by-side -side with Hillary Clinton at the Rose Law Firm and the man who Clinton had as his number three person in the Department of Justice until Webb resigned. The same Webb Hubble who is now a felon as a result of pleading guilty to Whitewater-related crimes. I believe they included overbilling the government when Webb was at the Rose Law Firm and tax invasion. It looks like Webb Hubble will soon be a star prosecution witness in the Whitewater investigation. Terry, it seems the Ward family was right in the thick of things. Were there any other family members that play into the story? Yeah, yeah the Ward family is actually sort of infamous in Arkansas. Seth has a, uh, one son. His name is uh, Seth Jr. People call him Skeeter. Skeeter manages the family-owned business POM, or Park on Meter, in Russellville, Arkansas. And, of course, the world now knows that POM has a military division that has provided weapons parts for various concerns, including Ivers Johnson Firearms, the CIA's proprietary. You know, Skeeter even admitted this clandestine relationship in a secretly taped interview. I ran my machine second shift to make, get the parts out for them real quick, and they never really stiffed me, and they never paid. They were bankrupt. But you did make some parts for Ivers Johnson? I made, yeah, I made some firing pins, I think it was, on a screw machine. Uh, for them, it's about $12,000 worth, and they never paid. They filed bankruptcy. But an often overlooked ex-member of the Ward clan is Finus Shellnut. Finus surfaced briefly when the Jennifer Flowers scandal yeah. broke. It seems he and Bill Clinton were sharing You're Jennifer's favors. But when I met Finus in 1983, he was married to Seth Ward's youngest daughter, and it was Finus who worked for a bond trader named Dan Lassiter. Dan Lassiter? That's a name I've heard before. Isn't he Bill Clinton's old friend and wasn't he convicted of cocaine charges? Yeah, that's right. Uh, Dan Lassiter is another multimillionaire that enters into this story. Uh, Dan, of course, was a uh, very high-profile uh, bond trader who lived in Little Rock in the mid-1980s, traveled in very high social circles. In fact, it was Dan Lassiter who not only uh, employed Finus Shellnut, but it was Dan Lasseter who employed Roger Clinton as well. Dan Lasseter employed Roger Clinton, the president's brother? Didn't they both go to prison on cocaine charges? Yeah, that's right. You know, it was uh, Roger who was Dan's chauffeur, actually. And, of course, it was Dan Lasseter and Roger who got involved in the, the whole drug investigation that ultimately ended up ensnaring about 10 other prominent Arkansans, including an Arkansas state senator. So there was a multitude of people that went to, uh, that went to prison over this story. Uh, another interesting point, though, that I point out in my book, uh, Lassiter and Company, Dan Lassiter's firm, is where Barry Seal was doing not only his, but the CIA's investment banking. You're saying, as an insider, 
that you have knowledge of Barry Seal running the CIA's money through Lassiter and into the Arkansas bond business? That's exactly what I'm saying. You know, in fact, Barry Seal confided to me that he was taking millions of dollars of money uh, to Dan Lassiter to more or less be laundered through his firm in the form of loans, money being slipped back quietly to uh, CIA subcontractors, companies performing services for the CIA in Arkansas during this whole time frame. That, that sounds like a pretty slick arrangement, but it must have included people beyond Seal and Lassiter to pull that off without triggering questions from bank officials. Can you name any of the recipients of these fictitious loans? Yes, I can. Uh, in my book, in fact, I document a $2.75 million loan made to POM, or Park on Meter. Now, that money was diverted through ADFA, Arkansas Development and Finance Authority, which in, in itself was a quasi-state-run organization set up by Bill Clinton for the purpose of administering loans to underprivileged companies. Terry, are you saying that ADFA, the Arkansas Development Finance Authority, a state agency, was created by Bill Clinton as a way to launder CIA money? I can say this. From its inception in 1985 to 1991, ADFA loaned out over $719 million. Now, there have been Freedom of Information lawsuits filed in Arkansas trying to get the state to show the buyers of those bonds, the, the bond sales that went to create that kind of money. To date, there's been no admission by the state of where that money came from. And the POM loan, going back to it, was in violation of ADFA's charter because certainly POM would have qualified for outside loans without ADFA's backing. That is a lot of money. Nearly three quarters of a billion dollars. And you say Barry Seal's organization was responsible for bringing in a substantial amount of that cash. Well, by Seal's own estimate, he was flying in nearly $40 million a month into Little Rock at the height of the money laundering activities in 1985. Tell me, has, has anyone else surfaced who could help corroborate the strange goings-on within the bond industry of Arkansas? Yes, there's a man named Dennis Patrick and others who have surfaced, but Patrick can document over $109 million was laundered through his bond trading account in uh, the mid-1980s. Where was Patrick doing his trading? At Dan Lassiter's. At the same time frame, Barry Seal was flying in the agency's money. A hundred and nine million dollars. <laughs> no wonder they call Arkansas the land of opportunity. But tell me, when was the MENA operation as you knew it? When was it curtailed and why did the CIA shut it down? Since you brought up their old state slogan, to answer that, you really must go back to their other state slogan, which is Arkansas is a natural high. You see, it was the drug investigation into Dan Lassiter, and Roger Clinton that caused the CIA to abruptly curtail their operation and pull out. What had transpired was by 1986, there were two independent grand juries being formed to really start probing into all this money laundering activity, which, which appeared to be coming from a major drug operation. The last thing the CIA needed was for a multitude of their assets to be dragged before federal grand juries. Terry, I recall in your book you talking of a high-level secret meeting taking place near Little Rock uh, in early 1986. It included discussions of neutralizing the Justice Department's probe into Mina and Dan Lassiter's firm. Tell us about that meeting. Who attended and why was the meeting called? The meeting you're referring to is the meeting I call the bunker meeting since the meeting took place in a World War II ammunition storage bunker at Camp Robinson, an army camp slightly northwest of uh, Little Rock. The meeting had been called actually as an operational transitional meeting to discuss the nuts and bolts of moving part of this operation to Mexico. But what transpired was a rather heated discussion between Bill Clinton and the CIA's uh, designee from Washington concerning damage control for the Clinton 
gubernatorial administration. Now let me get this straight. You're saying you can place Bill Clinton directly in the Iran-Contra loop. I certainly can. And you know I almost wish I couldn't because I feel a lot of my legal problems stem from the fact that, that Clinton thrust himself into that meeting, but basically exposing himself to all of us that were attending and thus, in essence, compromising himself. Whom did he compromise himself to? Well, certainly me. You know, I was asked to come in to cover the loose technical ends of, of my transfer to Guadalajara. The man who I was scheduled to have a one-on-one -on -one discussion with was uh, a man who I knew as Max Gomez, who was gonna be my new handler in Mexico. Beyond that, uh, John Cathy, my old uh, CIA handler from Oklahoma City was there. Uh, Aki Sawahata, who was the local CIA resident case officer in Little Rock, he attended the meeting. Um, and in addition to that, the person that was supposed to come in and represent the state's interest was a man named Bob Nash, who was the director of Arkansas Development and Finance Authority. Terry, I've read your book. Now, most of these people weren't really using their real names, were they? They had code names, right? Well, you know, I would find uh, years later that I was orbiting in some pretty high circles, some very high echelons that even to this day still impress me. Uh, let's try to decode these guys. Uh, first of all, John Cathy is, in fact, Oliver North. Um, secondly, Max Gomez, now that's interesting. Gomez is in fact Felix Rodriguez. Rodriguez, not only being an ex-CIA agent going back to the Bay of Pigs, uh, the Phoenix Project in Vietnam, Felix Rodriguez uh, is a close confidant of George Bush's and the man who tracked down and was even uh, around during the assassination of Che Guevara. Che Guevara being Fidel Castro's lieutenant. Uh, beyond that, we had uh, Aki Sawahata, still a mystery man to me. Uh, we still don't know his real identity. But the man named Robert Johnson is actually William P. Barr, who was later the attorney general for George Bush. Now, I believe I've named everyone, but. Uh, there were two people that we think were still using their correct names, and that being Bob Nash and, and Bill Clinton. Of course we know now Bill Clinton's real name isn't Bill Clinton. <laughs> Let's get back to the discussions of damage control. Well, you've already witnessed the frustration of several police officers who just could not get the MENA story to go forward. Their investigations seemed to be contained or undermined, short-circuited, whatever you want to call them. In that bunker meeting, uh, I witnessed the containment effort for this entire scandal, and quite frankly, it's shocking to realize all it took was for the authority of two U.S. attorneys to be undermined. The language that was used was that these guys would basically get religion, and if our system of checks and balances is that fragile, uh, something's wrong. But obviously, that's what went on because the rest is history. There were no indictments handed up. So two U.S. attorneys were somehow told just to back off? Is that right? That's exactly what I'm saying. You know, so-called national security interest can undermine the whole Justice Department if a setting attorney general does not challenge the marching orders given him by the president, and in this case, the director of the CIA. So how many times did you meet with Bill Clinton? Actually, on three separate occasions. Uh, only two of which I'm free to discuss on this interview. The third may come up in my court case in Little Rock, Arkansas. But you've heard about the first one, the one in the so-called bunker meeting. The second one took place outside of a Mexican food restaurant in Little Rock named Juanita's. Um, that brief encounter, impromptu encounter, was to discuss uh, my moving on down to Mexico to uh, help set up the uh, CIA's front company at the Guadalajara airport. Terry, why would Clinton care if you moved to Mexico or not? You know, that's a good question. And in hindsight, I'm sure Bill Clinton saw me as a liability. You know, considering what all I had seen while I worked there with the 
Central Intelligence Agency, considering the social circles I was orbiting in. Well, I'm sure he was just as, quite frankly, wanted me as far from Little Rock, Arkansas as he could get me. So in other words, he wanted you out of Dodge City, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, that's right. There were, there were no threatening comments, but uh, he made it very clear uh, while sitting there in his van outside the restaurant that, that uh, he wanted me to go ahead and continue with my plans to, to move to Mexico to fulfill my obligation with the CIA. You moved to Mexico to set up this front company for the CIA. Sounds exciting. Well, you know, quite frankly, it got a little more exciting than I had bargained for. Uh, my job was really just to move to the Guadalajara airport, set up a company, Machinery International, uh, who was a, to be a bona fide company, a company to uh, operate in the machine tool industry, a company to bring in equipment to help automate Mexico. Now, of course, covertly, it was to perform services for the uh, U.S. government. Just exactly what did these covert services include? Phase one of the plan was pretty simple. This company was to store, warehouse, safeguard, transship weapons, uh, weapons that were destined ultimately for Central America. Uh, phase two of the plan, however, which I found much more interesting, was that Machinery International would serve as a controlling entity to actually manufacture weapons on Mexican soil. Were the plans implemented? Well, I moved my family to Mexico in July of 1986, but phase one of the plan was abruptly interrupted in October of that same year due to the uh, C-123 shootdown. That uh, incident caused us all to uh, basically lie low for a while. However, by January of 1987, we all breathed a sigh of relief and decided to, to go forward with the plan, thinking that the Mexican side of, of the enterprise hadn't really been discovered. Um, phase two, uh, just as we were starting into phase two, uh, I was sort of uh, taken out of the operation due to what I call as a, a riff with my CIA handlers. Terry, tell us about that riff. In the book, you keep us on the edge of our seats while you negotiate your way out of Mexico. But this was a little more than a casual riff. This was life and death stuff. Well, you know, my agreement with the CIA was to transship weapons, plain and simple. Uh, no one had ever discussed transshipment of drugs with me. If, if they had, I wouldn't have been involved in any of this. But by... Uh, Early 1987, I had proved to myself beyond the shadow of a doubt that some of the people I was working with uh, were using uh, my facility and using uh, the aircraft that were hauling the weapons in order to transship cocaine back to the United States. How much cocaine? Literally tons. You know, we're not talking kilos here, but tons. So there is no war on drugs? Not from what I ever saw, at least not uh, while operating out of Guadalajara. Um, you know, my whole problem began when I just took Nancy Reagan's advice and, and tried to say no to the drug trafficking side of this story. Do you have any evidence of the CIA's drug trafficking through your facilities? Any witnesses? Yes, in fact, it was a very credible witness. And um, I might add, he's been thoroughly deposed about his observations of cocaine being transshipped through my Guadalajara warehouse. In the book, you detailed a trip to San Miguel de Allende, a town in Mexico, where you confronted Felix Rodriguez, a.k.a. Max Gomez, with your evidence that his operation was in the drug business. Tell us about that meeting. First of all, there's a witness to that meeting. Uh, I planned it that way. I took a Mexican citizen friend of mine, a man named Patrick Juin, to basically um, serve as my, my insurance policy. I uh, strategically positioned Patrick uh, in a restaurant so he could observe uh, Max Gomez, a.k.a. Felix Rodriguez, and Rodriguez could observe him. Uh, you know, I kid you not, I was frightened. Uh, the good side is Patrick didn't have to witness a homicide. 
And uh, of course, the bad side is uh, things didn't turn out as we agreed in that meeting. So you and Mr. Gomez came to an amicable agreement? He considered you a loose cannon, right? I mean, you just, you wouldn't go along with the drug trafficking. You just waltzed out of there? Well, that's what happened, although I did have a major bargaining chip. Uh, I was in possession of evidence that concretely proved that cocaine had been transshipped uh, through my warehouse by CIA people. What kind of concrete evidence? Well, I had samples of the shipment that I had found in my warehouse in Guadalajara July 5th, 1987. You see, I had had the wherewithal to safeguard a few kilos just to be used as evidence, seeing as how my handlers kept complaining I lacked concrete evidence. It was mutually agreed upon that I didn't have what it took to be a CIA agent, and uh, I should probably leave Mexico. So eventually it was agreed upon that my wife and I and our three sons could travel back to the U.S. unharmed. But you were double-crossed, weren't you? I mean, you do say in the book you found out you weren't dealing with honorable men. Correct. And that's where this story gets real personal and real scary. Uh, shortly after my family and I crossed the Rio Grande, we were able to ascertain that there had been a computer profile created on us that labeled us pretty much a modern-day Bonnie and Clyde. That profile showed us as being armed and dangerous. It said that we con carried concealed weapons, had been known to use them in the past. Of course, it labeled me as a, as a high-profile drug trafficker operating out of Central and South America. Uh, you know, and besides that, we found out that people were actively trying to determine our whereabouts. What did you think they wanted? Well, most assuredly, they wanted me to meet the same demise as Barry Seal. They wanted me and my wife dead. Terry, did you ever find out who created the false computer profile of you and your wife? And yes, that person is Bill Clinton's old chief of security, Arkansas State Police Captain Raymond Buddy Young. Now, Mr. Young is no longer with the Arkansas State Police, however, uh, Mr. Young is now with FEMA, or Federal Emergency Management Authority, for the Southwest out of Denton, Texas. But you and your wife have sued Buddy Young and the others who say you were involved in this ordeal, correct? Yeah, the criminal justice system was obviously used against me and my wife by some very powerful, selfish, and cowardly individuals. Uh, We've sued the people that we feel we can prove helped orchestrate the wrongful criminal indictment against us. Uh, you know, I'm not going to sleep until I can drag those people to court. They have to be held accountable for their actions. In fact, the federal judge who acquitted me said that Young and another ex-trooper had what he called demonstrated a reckless disregard for the truth. Now, Harry Truman, my old hero, wouldn't have been so kind with his selection of words. Harry would have said, they are blatant liars who perjure themselves as they try desperately to get me and my wife convicted on trumped up felony charges, just to destroy my credibility. But I'm still win willing to give the system its chance to work and drag those who attempt to destroy me to justice. Terry, do you feel threatened? I mean, you're obviously making some very powerful people very, very nervous. Sure, I'm human. And I operate under a continuous threat of not only to my person, but my family as well. You know, our, our phones have been bugged. We've had burglaries. Uh, I've had a written death threat pasted on top of a cover page of Time magazine. These are cowardly people who it's difficult to tell what they would resort to once we get them fully cornered. But uh, I can tell you this, I know what they're most frightened of and it's a court of law. Come now and meet the woman Janice Reed, who was needlessly and mercilessly targeted and pursued by government agents. Meet Terry Reed's wife, the woman who has stood steadfast by his side during this strenuous ordeal. Janice, tell us, what is it like to marry a spy? To live a double life as the, as the wife of a spy? It was an interesting situation in that 
we were dealing with the FBI, the CIA, and the KGB, and it was hard to tell who was whom. When you and Terry decided to get married, who did he tell you he was spying for? It was with the FBI in, in a relationship with the CIA. Did you meet some of the other agents and spies Terry was working with? Yes, I met quite a few. He was dealing with uh, several international people, a lot of Japanese, a lot of Hungarians, and then someone who surfaced later in the news uh, that I met as John Cathy. He later surfaced as Oliver North, but I did meet him in Oklahoma City. Do you have any distinct memories of Oliver North? Well, as a matter of fact, he happened to be in town uh, when I gave birth to my oldest son, Duncan, uh, and John Cathy, who later became known to me as Oliver North, uh, came by the hospital with Terry and brought roses and, uh, and offered his congratulations. When you moved to Little Rock and Terry began working with Oliver North's Contra training program, did you know then what he was doing? Yes, to a certain extent. Um, he, peripherally, I knew uh, what he was involved with. Uh, I preferred not to know all the details, and obviously he was not going to tell me all the details. What was his main job in the Barry Seal operation? It ultimately ended up working in the MENA, Arkansas area, training Contra pilots. Who were some of the Arkansas's power elite that Terry's CIA assignment put him into play with? I mentioned Webster Hubble. Of course, we were, my husband was acquainted with Bill Clinton, uh, Vincent Foster. Um, a lot of that group from the Rose Law Firm were acquaintances. After Arkansas, after Arkansas, you and Terry moved to Mexico to work for the CIA. How did you like living in Mexico? I fell in love with it. I mean, the people are so genuine and just wonderful, warm people. And I found it being a wonderful experience for my family. How many children did you have when you moved there? Uh, when we moved there, I had two. When we left, I had three. These are all boys? All little, mm-hmm, all little boys. What was Terry doing for the CIA in Mexico, and what happened? Terry was involved in, uh, he had a front company. That's what was going on. Uh, we had a legitimate manufacturing operation going on down there. Uh, <clears throat> But in the summer of 1987, he came across some drugs, cocaine as a matter of fact, a large shipment. And once he became aware of that and I became aware of that, we decided this is not what we're down here for. We were being used and we just wanted away from it. What was the role of the front company? A CIA front company normally has more than one purpose. Uh, Terry has a manufacturing background uh, and he's technology is one of his true loves. Uh, he was involved in high-tech machine tool equipment, uh, shipping it down to Mexico, uh, trying to start up businesses down there, which is very legitimate as what, what was going on then and is what is still going on now. Uh, through this company, he also allowed weapons to be shipped through the company, and he was aware of that and went along with that. What we weren't aware of is crates were being shipped back through his company back into the United States by agents down there uh, and they were shipments of drugs and cocaine and this was done with the knowledge of the US government. When you became aware of this how did you react? Oh, I, I was I was terrified. Uh, I, did, I did not want any part of the drug world. That whole world they have their own set of rules. I was down there, I was a mother, I had a family, I had three little boys to think about. That's not what I bargained for. I wanted out, and Terry did too. How did you and Terry extricate yourselves from this dangerous environment? Um, it wasn't just an automatic overreaction. Terry and I sat down, we decided how we're gonna get out of this mess. And over the course of about a month, we tried to set things in play that would get us out of there. It ended up with a fairly uh, argumentative confrontation with one of his handlers down there, and it was not a pleasant scene. And he said, well, okay, well, we're just going back to the States. We went out of here. I don't want any more to do with this, and we're gone. And we left, and that's when our troubles began. What were your plans as you left Mexico? We thought we were going to the States to get help, 
to see Oliver North, to see the people that were behind setting us up in Mexico, we thought, well, we'll just tell them what's going on, they'll understand, they'll take care of it. We're very naive. After returning to the U.S., what happened? Bit by bit, we found out how deeply we were involved in this. And Terry found out more and more how much inside the inner circle he was, unwittingly and unknowingly. And based on that, I was very much a part of that, too, by virtue of the fact I was married to him. Um, once we got back to the States, we found out our parents were getting phone calls, for, uh, suspicious phone calls, wanting to know our whereabouts. Uh, when agents started showing up at the doorstep of my mother-in-law and my parents saying they were looking for us, we got the message real fast that this was not going to be fun. So you were being painted as drug traffickers and agents of the U.S. government were looking for you? They went to my sister, they went to my mother, they went to my father, they went to Terry's 72-year-old mother and threatened. They threatened family members saying, you turn over your children, tell us where they are. If you don't, you're in trouble with the law too and you can be incarcerated. When we were dealing with that, with our elderly parents, seeing them being threatened, we knew this was for real and they weren't going to be understanding. They were after us. What did you do then? At that point in time, we, we decided we're going to take off. We're going to run because obviously they were not being reasonable. They did not want to hear our side of the story. How does it feel to be pursued by government agents when you've done nothing wrong? But during the course of this, when I realized I had no one to turn to, I had no place to go. I was a citizen wronged, but where could I go? The people I, sh I felt I should be able to go to were the people that were after me. That, the level of despair when I realized that, like I am a person without a country, uh, that was something that was very difficult to deal with. So you and Terry fled for your lives. Yes, in fact, we had a motor home and, a, and three little boys and a German Shepherd dog, and we took off, not knowing, not having any idea where we were headed. Um, initially, we had felt that there was someone in Washington that was going to help us, but we soon came to learn we were being double-crossed. We had no idea. Nothing can prepare you for this sort of shock. How do you feel? Uh, my husband is a very patriotic person, as well as I am. And the fact that we thought we were doing the right thing uh, and helping our government, helping our country, and then to have this happen, I can't tell you what it does to you as a human being. I'm, the, the trauma and the shock and the despair one feels and the loneliness, thinking it's just us out here being chased. What was your loneliest moment? During the course of all this, when all this came about, my father had a stroke. I was there at the hospital with him when all this came down on us. I had to leave in the middle of the night with my family, and I had to make a decision. If I leave my father now, I may never see him again, but I also have three children that are depending on me, and someone is wanting to take me away from them. And I had to make a decision. It was very, very, that was probably the most difficult point of my life um, when I had to leave my father in the hospital. I felt very alone and the despair was almost more than I could imagine and bear. How did you deal with this pain? I guess when you work through all these phases like the shock, the denial, the anger, you know, Terry and I had to work through that in about 48 hours. I mean, we had to get through it. If we had wallowed in that and gone through all those phases, we would have been captured. We didn't have time for that. We had too many, our children relied on us, and we had too many responsibilities. So we worked through that real fast and then got into the survival mode. Where did you run to initially? We ended up in San Diego. We spent Christmas in San Diego. Uh, we thought that's right near the border, and Terry's thought was that's the last place they'd, that the reeds would go, that would be a stupid place to hang out is at the border. They might be combing the borders. So do the unexpected. I mean, he had years of intelligence training and uh, you know, 
in that in that facet of this whole saga, I mean, he relied on his training and it saved us. Dennis, what sticks in your mind about that period of your life? It was just uh, the feeling of of despair I had that Christmas, knowing I was I was a wanted fugitive, uh, and watching everyone around in the Christmas spirit, all the families singing, caroling, watching the Christmas specials. I, I felt I had so much pain that Christmas, but I had to. I, I made a true attempt to keep up a facade for the children, you know, trying to sing carols with them, make Christmas ornaments. You know, it was just. I, it was all. I felt like remote control. I was just a robot going through the motions. Uh, but the pain that was pro um, that was my worst Christmas ever. How old were your children that Christmas? Baxter was the baby. He was six months old. Um, Elliot was two and a half, and Duncan was had just turned five. Did you do anything else in San Diego besides celebrate a tense Christmas? Well, not knowing what was going on within the national computer system or the law enforcement system, we definitely were not comfortable being Terry and Janice Reed. Uh, we spent the time in San Diego establishing a corporation uh, establishing new identities and once we had that taken care of we were a little more comfortable uh, leaving. I mean, we definitely did not want to stay there for any length of time and we felt more comfortable being removed from our previous persons to F. Terry and Janice Reed. Where did you go then? We left San Diego and eventually ended up in Maine uh, which is about as far as we could drive as you wandered around America, how did you control your fear and your anxiety? Yeah, I had to focus on one day at a time, and, and that was as a mother, as a school teacher. It was not as a fugitive from our government, uh, and that's what kept me going. Uh, we had a motor home. I decorated it. I put the alphabet chart up, the numbers, George Washington. Uh, we had a little school session going every day, and we had some great geography lessons. I mean, he went to most of the national parks. We saw Old Faithful, we saw Niagara Falls, and he's, the children are standing in front of all these uh, national monuments. We've got all kinds of photos uh, of that year. And These government agents who were tampering in law enforcement computers, how did they portray you? What, what kind of lies did these renegade agents insert into the computers? I, I later found out after I obtained my FBI file through discovery that we had been labeled armed and dangerous as ne very nefarious characters and that was so frightening. Who were you the most frightened of? I, I'm not saying the FBI is, is a bad agency or the CIA. My, our concern was the renegade agents out there uh, that are totally out of control. Yeah. Um, and that's who I was most frightened of. And the power they can wield, they are legitimate agents, and the power they have to alter your profile in NCIC. Um, I had done nothing other than being married to Terry Reed. What was Terry doing throughout all of this? He's a very calculating person. Uh, he had his uh, manual for flight instruction and how to deal with stress under pressure. And I, he would want me to read all these manuals. And I'd go, no, that's not the way I operate. You know, I mean, he, he can sit there, remove himself from the situation and know how he should react. I'm more emotional. I can't sit there and read how to deal with stress and just incorporate that. It's, that's not, I thought that's obviously much easier said than done. I'd got a lot of strength from him as well as he got a lot of strength from me. He knew I was there to take care of the children. That facet of his life was being cared for by me. I knew he was there to get us out of this mess. I mean, I had to have this belief that with his training and his background and knowledge that he would somehow get us out. He, he monitored that phase. I took care of the nurturing, the maternal, the family. And he relied on me for that. We needed each other. Janice, what if you got separated or one of you was arrested? Had Terry covered that contingency? We had a plan. We pl uh, Terry always had plan A, B, and C in envelopes, in code talk. And I had to have those memorized. But we knew where we were going to rendezvous if, or, or what each plan was. Now, how long did this last? How long were you on the run? 
over six months we were on the run. After that length of time, you just start to question, what are we doing? We obviously had evaded them. Terry did a very good job keeping us out of harm's way. Uh, it got to the point, though, we did feel very threatened. I started, I've been asked before, what were you, were you prepared to do? When I felt as a mother threatened, I, I would have been prepared to do anything. In fact, I got to the point, I did get a Smith & Wesson 38 caliber featherweight and I carried it in our diaper bag. It was with me at all times because I never knew if someone was going to come barging in the door. That could happen. If they had located us, if they had put a monitor on us, they could have found us easily, barging our door in the middle of the night and trying to take us away. I was prepared to shoot. Being responsible for three little boys, I. I felt very capable of doing what I needed to do. How did you feel the day you stopped running? I think we were just so worn out. Uh, I, I guess we still had this hope, and Terry had, had enough contact thinking someone might be able to take care of this up the line. I mean, we wanted to think that. We were told that was going on. Uh, we just didn't know. but. You just get to the point, you can't do this forever. We're not being fair to our children, our families, ourselves, going through this trauma. Then what transpired? Two and a half years in the criminal justice system. And that, I can tell you, is no fun. Our troubles were just beginning. What do you believe led to your charges? There was never any evidence um, on my part that I should ever have been indicted. In fact, I sat in the federal court one day and the judge said, pointed to me and goes, well, I can't figure out why she's here. And uh, none of us could, other than the fact I had a marriage license and I'd married Terry Reed, and that's why I was there. I was used as a pawn uh, to get back at Terry. I was approached on numerous occasions saying, hey, you tell us everything you know, you, t you tell us everything about your husband and we'll let you go. Well, first of all, I had nothing to say and second of all, I wouldn't do that. I mean, I was not, I can't be used as a pawn. I was offended that they were trying to use me for that and putting me through the pain of the indictment process. We were both up for 20 years. Mm -hmm. I mean, living with that every day and dragging on for two and a half years, I mean, it's, it's amazing we survived. Why was Terry charged? He was set up. The problem with Terry was, um, in some of these activities, uh, covert activities, there's often people from the criminal world that get involved. Uh, CIA, FBI, they like to use uh, drug smugglers or former criminals or pilots that have a record because you know they're um, they're compromised. Terry had no record. I mean, he had a squeaky clean background, so um, you know they needed something to set him up with, which is what happened. Was it a nightmare being in the criminal justice system? Yes, as a matter of fact, being involved in the criminal justice system for as long as we were was a rude awakening. Um, I found out that justice, um, justice is not out there unless you have a whole lot of money. Uh, I hate to say that, but uh, we were forced to liquidate everything we had. Uh, we had a little money at the time. That was all depleted immediately. Uh, we were forced to get two different attorneys, um, which, because of conflict, they tried to turn uh, me against him. Um, and after two and a half years, we did not declare bankruptcy. However, our credit was ruined. Um, we were nearly destitute after the fact, after we were uh, found innocent uh, through freedom of information, we found documents that would have totally exonerated us that the prosecution had within their, uh, with, right there within their office that they, they suppressed. Uh, so the, the, the shock and the horror just continued. Initially it was all physical, emotional, and later it was just the shock of this is the way it works and no one is held accountable. That's what's so wrong. I sat there in the courtroom watching a prosecutor point the finger at me saying I deserve to be locked up when I had done nothing. I was found innocent. Terry was found innocent. We walked out of the courtroom that day. It's like, adios. It's been nice. It's like there's no restitution. Our lives were destroyed. Financially and emotionally, we were just devastated. 
It's like, sorry, I guess we made a mistake. But they don't even say that. You know, you walk out with a piece of paper, not guilty. You know, goodbye. Our system is out of control. There is no check and balance. And that's what's frightening. Janice, do you feel this is the way the system has always worked? Or have things changed? Now, this is not the America I grew up with. In fact, I can't believe this is America. I can't believe this is what our, our system has degenerated to. I want to go back in time. I grew up in the 50s. I want to start over. We need to start looking back the way it used to be when people were honest, when people were accountable. That's what needs to happen because this is not the America I grew up with. What would you like to tell the American people about the corruption within the Justice Department? We were discussing how I felt when we were acquitted. Um, we went through a very brief period where we thought, well, let's just start all over. You know, let's just take it, pick up where we left off. Well, we found we couldn't do that. We had gone through too much just to walk away from it. I, and I knew Terry would, he couldn't live with himself. When you sit in federal court and watch uh, state troopers and government officials sit there and perjure themselves, uh, and the prosecutor knows that, uh, that, that's not right. But Janice, you're fighting within an obviously corrupt system. Do you honestly think you can win? Well, I'm a 60s person. <laughs> I mean, that's inherent. That's an inherent part of me. I, you know, I still have this sense of right will prevail. And, I, you know, I, I think sometimes I'm terribly stupid to think that. But um, Terry and I got acquitted. I didn't think that would happen. Um, I'm committed. I, I do have this belief that we can make a difference. Terry Reed fought the Vietnam War and survived. He and Janice fought the criminal justice system and they won against tremendous odds. They are now fighting Time Magazine and will surely prevail. And to show you just how vindictive Time Magazine became when they pulled out the stops to help get Bill Clinton elected, listen to the following taped conversation between Time reporter Richard Behar and Toshiba Machine Tool executive Takashi Osato. Can I, can I ask you something? Yeah. Terry says uh -huh. that he did some um, intelligence work yes. for the FBI. Why, who be I? The FBI, uh -huh. when he was working uh, with Toshiba. What? Yeah. I don't, I don't know what the he means. Uh, he was working for the... Uh, the FBI. You know the FBI? Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, trying to find out yeah. how machinery is going from Japan to America. That he was uh, uh -huh. he he was working as an agent. Oh really? For the FBI. I didn't know that. I well. Is that, I, I have no knowledge about that. In that conversation, Behar irresponsibly and for no apparent reason blew Terry Reed's cover as a spy. Up until that point, the Japanese machine tool community knew nothing about Terry's undercover work with the U.S. government. Terry is now a marked man and considered a traitor by the Japanese. As Terry said earlier, desperate people can be very dangerous when cornered, especially wealthy and influential desperate people. Betsy Wright... Bill Clinton's personal friend and chief of staff for all the years he was governor is now in Washington as one of the most influential and expensive lobbyists, exploiting and selling her relationship with the Clintons. Wright is attacking the credibility of both Terry and his book in such a below-the-belt manner that it's difficult to defend oneself. From the following comments, it's clear to see the Clintons and their machine have some tricks up their sleeves. The book is so false as to be laughable. I mean, this man's fantasy level probably qualifies him for some kind of institutionalization. I, I pass mentally ill people on the streets and wonder if it's Terry Reed. Uh, you know, I, this is pathetic, this person. Terry Reed and his wife, Janice, have been fighting a long, lonely battle for over four years, attempting to not only bring these men to justice, but to also unearth the Mina-Iran-Contra connection. 
They're convinced that the American public has a right to the truth. They feel they are defending the Constitution of the United States of America and that this country should never resort to drug trafficking to finance secret foreign policy. Their crusade could shed some much-needed light on a government out of control to the extent that the Central Intelligence Agency is compromising the office of the president. The allegations there are of the most serious nature involving allegations of high crimes in high places in Washington. They involve allegations that a C-123, C-130 operation, contract operation, uh, was operating out of Mena Airport, transporting guns to Central America and returning drugs to Arkansas and laundering money in Arkansas from the sale of those drugs. Beyond that, one has to wonder if the executive branch has devoured the judicial branch. Does the country still have a triangular balance of power between executive, legislative, and judicial? The Reed case has the potential to expose political prisoners rotting behind bars simply because they have become liabilities to corrupt politicians. It's shocking to believe that this great nation has resorted to gulags. Come now and meet the nucleus of the legal team the Reeds have assembled. These courageous lawyers will tell you firsthand the significance of the Reeds' constitutional rights case, a case that could revisit the Iran-Contra cover-up, a case that could possibly lead to the impeachment of a sitting president, and a battle that continues. Let's ask Robert Maloney, a man who has practiced law exclusively in federal court for over 14 years, what attracted him to the Reeds case. One of the things I discovered during a two-year period uh, I've been representing Terry and Jan was that it was much more than a run-of-the-mill civil rights case. Um, it's about corruption, corruption at, at the most, the deepest levels of government. In 1986, when a C-123 transport plane uh, under maintenance and ownership of the CIA was shot down over Nicaragua. People thought it was unbelievable that the CIA was running a covert operation in violation of the express, the express wishes of the American public as contained in the Bolin Amendments. That was unbelievable. But we've learned since then that it was just as true. People may find it unbelievable that certain elements of our own government are trafficking in narcotics. Uh, maybe for personal gain, maybe thinking that the ends justify the means, that what they're doing, dealing in drugs, or using drugs to support their efforts, and in this case, the Contra effort, was somehow legitimate. Terry Reed felt the Contra effort was legitimate when he found out that people in the same operation he was working in were dealing in drugs, made a moral choice and a courageous one, and as a result, he left it and was persecuted for it. Terry Reed knew a lot about what happened in this operation, both in the state of Arkansas and in the CIA. For that knowledge, he was persecuted for it. For being Terry Reed's wife, Janice Reed was persecuted for it. And their children were dragged along into this mess with them. Three children who haven't known anything more than the fact that their parents are constantly fighting this unknown force. What we've come to know as the Iran-Contra scandal and now the MENA scandal is only part of the story. What we've learned was that there was a cover-up of a lot of those stories. A lot of the MENA scandal has been covered up. There are federal, state, and local officials who have said that they've been stonewalled, subverted, and obstructed in getting this evidence out. That's not the end of the story. The media in this country, the major publishers, networks, haven't covered this story. In fact, one of them has done even worse. Time Warner, during the heat of the presidential campaign, did what we consider to be a hatchet job on Terry Reid. Instead of reporting on Amina scandal, which their reporter, Richard Behar, had been investigating for years, 
Time Warner and Time Magazine decided to do a story on Terry to cut him off at the knees. What's more shocking is that they set out to undermine the full and accurate and balanced reporting of a scandal that had been in the local press in Arkansas for years. In the two years I've done this case, I've had dozens of phone calls from people I look at as political prisoners. They ask for my help, and my heart goes out to them. But what it shows me is that this, thi this, this type of practice does go on in this country. The fact that it's unbelievable that this could happen to people like Terry and Janice Reed doesn't make it untrue. Mr. Maloney, who should care about this case? Law and order people or civil libertarians? This case is not about which side you're on. The only side that we're on is on the side of the Constitution and on the side of Terry and Janice Reed. And anybody who believes in the Constitution should be on our side. Abby Hoffman said, democracy is not something you believe in, it's something you do. Democracy is something that we're doing right now. I'm doing my job as an attorney. Terry's doing it as a citizen. People from all over the country who are beginning to back us are now practicing democracy. That's the way it's meant to be. We need more people to join us in this fight. Anybody who's willing to fight is free to contact us to donate whatever they can, to lend whatever encouragement or support. Now, let's talk to seasoned trial lawyer Michael Dowd, a man who has been up against the CIA in federal courtrooms in the past, and a man who's committed to defending constitutional freedoms. This is not the first case I come to where justice is at stake in a case. I've defended people before who've been prosecuted, and I'd like to really say it, persecuted uh, by the misuse of laws in this country, the Central Intelligence Agency, to stop them from fighting for that which is the most fundamental and basic thing that any of us have as human beings, freedom. It's what this country is all about. And in those battles, I've faced the CIA and I've faced uh, representatives of the CIA and all that they do to try to suppress the truth. And uh, in those struggles and in those cases, uh, it's always been hard, but it's always been worth the fight. And Terry Reed, for too long, has been denied uh, the right to live in peace. He was pursued and persecuted wrongly. And now the corrupt people who tried to cover up their misdeeds continue to try to persecute him by silencing him in this case that he has. Well, there are a few of us that believe that protecting his freedom means protecting our own freedom. And hopefully there are going to be some people around this country that are going to be listening to me, that are going to see that fighting for Terry Reid and standing up for Terry Reid is really standing up for them. Because what happened to Terry Reid and Janice Reid can happen to any of us. And if we don't understand that, then maybe we're all going to be lost. Mr. Dowd, what can the American people do to help? We're facing uh, a well-financed army of lawyers out there to keep the truth from coming out. And it'd just be plain foolish not to think that we don't need, in this case, um, the ammunition, frankly, in dollars and cents to fight this battle. Uh, we're doing all we can, but we've got court costs to pay, we've got reporters, we've got investigation to do. There are a lot of costs that mount up answering the m papers that come in in volumes from our opposition, um, aimed at stopping us from getting our uh, Terry and Janice's day in court. That, that plain and simple folks cost money. A lot of ordinary people have reached out their hands to help Terry Reed. But we need more help because any court case costs a lot of money to try to get this story and the truth of this story before a jury and the American people. We need a lot of help. Help for Terry and Janice Reed, but very much this is a story about helping all of us because we're not really going to be free 
until the truth of this story comes out. The following secret FBI communique is an example of documentation concerning MENA that is surfacing through the Reeds court case in Arkansas. In it, the FBI in Chicago is warning the CIA and Little Rock's FBI office of a pending media investigation into MENA, and particularly Barry Seal. One can clearly see that someone was using the resources of the FBI to not investigate, but only to circle the wagons fearing complete exposure of the MENA operations. What you have witnessed clearly shows that powerful politicians will resort to any means available to protect their selfish hides. They will destroy the lives of anyone considered a liability when their dirty little secrets are exposed and their political future is at stake. The lives of loyal and patriotic citizens are merely disposable if their demise somehow helps to bury a scandal of the magnitude of the Iran-Contra affair. Commanders-in-chief, such as Ronald Reagan, George Bush, and now Bill Clinton, who have taken oaths to lead and protect this great nation will, with no notice, turn and devour those they are leading if the situation suits them. Adler Berryman Seal was assassinated in order to assure what he had stored in his brain was never made available in a court of law. Eugene Hassenfuss was abandoned and smothered with lies when he became a living link to failed foreign policy being run out of the back door of the National Security Council. Professional law enforcement officers such as Bill Duncan were discarded and ridiculed when they refused to turn a blind eye to the subversion of the judicial system. Terry Reed and his family were stalked and hunted like animals simply because they possessed information damaging to the ruling oligarchy. The criminal justice system in this country is being used as a weapon of political retribution. Terry and Janice Reed experienced this firsthand, but they fought back, and against all odds, they prevailed. They escaped the label of felon a label used to destroy one's credibility when one becomes an extreme liability such as Terry. Now, through the federal court system, the Reeds are continuing their fight. There, within the mahogany paneled walls of a federal courtroom in Little Rock, Arkansas, they are trying to not only correct the wrongs levied upon them by selfish and faceless bureaucrats, but to protect the Constitution of the United States of America as well. The Reeds and their lawyers hope to leave behind a legacy of case law defining the punishment for those who attempt to discard, abandon, and destroy those who attempt to serve this country well. But the Reeds are learning another ugly lesson. Our system of justice hinges on only one thing, money, not fairness nor truth. As the prominent trial lawyer Jerry Spence wrote, Quoting Mr. Spence, although the government still gives lip service to the jury system and to our constitutional rights, trials have largely become public trappings to reinforce the myth that in America we are still free. End quote. There is nothing free about trying to right the wrongs brought about as the result of a manufactured crime and the resultant wrongful indictment. This is a capitalist society. And without money, there is no justice. Cases like the Reeds scream to be heard. Sometimes they simply wither and die if not properly funded. As Spence also wrote, again quoting Mr. Spence, the small but important case, the new or novel case, the case of principle with little damage, the just but difficult case requiring the investment of large sums of money for witnesses and research are all cases likely to be lost for want of a lawyer, leaving multitudes of just cases never to see the inside of a courtroom." End quote. Victory over drugs is our cause. No, they didn't tell me anything about it. They didn't say anything to me about it. 